Good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar for September. Uh, it's been an interesting month. Um, as you can see here on the screen, we've got the S&P 500. I've, I've uh, put in a piece uh, basically the last six months which shows this bear market rally which began in the middle of June and ended in the middle of August. Uh, it's quite a significant, well, a classic bear market rally, really. Um, uh, that bear market rally recovered about 56.5% of the downward trend so far. Uh, in other words, it was on the S&P 500, it was 638 points out of the initial bear market of 1130. Um, I can tell you from experience that bear markets usually take the market down about 50%. Sorry, uh, bear, uh, bear market rallies usually take the market up about 50%. So this one was bigger than usual, higher than it should have been. Um, and, and I believe that this piece here above this 4170 support resistance line shows the excessive uh, optimism, which is a characteristic of this bear trend. We have a bear trend which has got unusually high levels of optimism among investors, which is unusual. In our view, the Ukraine war brought the bear market forward by about 18 months um, because obviously the Ukraine war resulted in a spike in the oil price and that impacted on world inflation, which caused central banks to start pushing up interest rates much harder and much faster than they would have otherwise done. We originally expected the bear trend to begin in the second half of 2024. In fact, we predicted a major correction um, in January this year, between 10 and 20 percent. And that was obviously an incorrect prediction uh, because that major correction turned into a bear trend. Uh, but we made that prediction in November last year in our confidential report. Uh, well before the Ukraine war had started. The war, of course, pushed markets beyond the correction and into a full-blown bear trend. The premature bear market meant that it came when the U.S. economy was still very strong. The Fed had only just begun increasing interest rates. They'd done two quarter percent hikes. And it was not expected that, that interest rate hikes would impact on economic growth for at least another two years at that point. At the time, the talk was of a soft landing for the economy. Well, the Ukraine invasion changed all that, jumped the oil price, forced the Fed to be more aggressive, and they put through two 75 basis point hikes in an effort to catch up. This pushed the market into a bear trend, but the economy was still booming. Many investors felt that the bear had started too soon and they were very keen to buy the dips. This enthusiasm increased when the oil price fell back to $100 a barrel in July. And, of course, at the same time, U.S. inflation fell from 9.1% to 8.5%. And that was greeted with what I can only describe as irrational exuberance. The S&P 500 gained 2.13% on the 10th of August when that was announced and reached a cycle high of 4,305. Reality came with Jerome Powell's 10-minute speech at Jackson Hole. And I've marked that on the chart here so that you can see where it happened. Uh, in that speech, he said that it would take time for them to bring interest rates high enough to reduce inflation to their 2% target. And that in, the, in the process, the economy and consumers would experience pain. Those were his words. This was like throwing a bucket of cold water over that bullish enthusiasm. And the S&P 500 has been falling ever since. If you look at the chart here, you can see the two-month two bear market rally from mid-June to mid-August. 
um, reaching that high of 4305. We've marked that in with a line there. Um, the chart shows the key areas of support and resistance, which are at 4170 and then again at 3900. In our view, this, this piece, which rises above the 4170 level, was caused by that excessive optimism in the marketplace. After Jackson Hole, uh, the market has fallen back quite dramatically to find the support at 3900. And you can see for the last four trading days, including last night, it's been bouncing along that uh, 3900 resistance level. In our view, there will be some backing and filling at the 3,900 level. And then sooner or later, we believe that this level will be broken on the downside. In fact, we're expecting this low at 3,666 to be taken out in due course as the bear market resumes. Bear markets usually take the index down 50% from their peak. So from the highest level, down 50%. If you apply that to the S&P 500, it means that the S&P should go to about 2,409. But of course, this is not a normal bear market. And that's something we have to keep in mind. This is not a normal bear market. The Fed is planning to buy back its $8.9 trillion balance sheet at the rate of $1.1 trillion per month, uh, sorry, per year. That's about $95 billion a month. Nobody really knows what the impact of this is going to be. It's never been done before. So uh, there is really no measure from history to tell us what the impact of quantitative tightening on this scale is going to be like. Bank of America says that the quantitative tightening or the, the reduction in the Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet will cut 7% off the S&P 500. We think that they may be conservative. But really, nobody knows. So 2,409, yes, that's the halfway mark. That's 50%. But it could be far worse than that. That's really what we're trying to tell you. The August 2022 jobs report in, in America came out and it showed that uh, the American economy created 315,000 new jobs in August month. This was slightly ahead of what was expected and the unemployment rate edged slightly up to 3.7% from 3.5%. Everyone is now waiting for the consumer price index figures which will come out on the 15th of September. The market is expecting a 75 basis point hike. About three quarters of the market expects that 75 basis point hike in September. We think the probability is actually higher than 75%. We think it's, it's more like 100%. So we, we believe that it's inevitable that the US economy will go into a recession next year. The factors which are keeping inflation high are deep-seated and they are far from under control. The effect of rising interest rates, of course, is cumulative. And we think that the impact of that will really begin to be felt in corporate profits only next year. The housing market still hasn't responded to the higher interest rates. And remember, the housing market is one-third of the consumer price index. So that's another factor to take into account. At the same time that this is happening in America, uh, the UK and Europe are also moving into recession. Inflation in the UK is expected to rise to 13.3% and the central bank is hiking rates rapidly to try and counter this. And of course there's a massive energy shortage in Germany as Russia has closed off supply of gas and uh, at the same time that this is going on, and, and that shut-off of gas in Germany is expected to put the German economy into a recession. And Germany, of course, is the biggest economy in Europe. And we have a brand new prime minister in England in the form of Liz Truss, who is taking over in very, very difficult circumstances. 
All right, let us turn our attention now to what is going on here in South Africa. On the political front, we've had the arrests of Molefe and uh, Siabonga Gama and Anuj Singh in the Transnet state capture case. This obviously is a boost to Ramaphosa's crime-fighting and corruption-fighting image. And we are told that it is the first of nine high-profile state capture cases that are being brought by the National Prosecuting Authority. The President has also launched an anti-corruption advisory council. So this is looking a little bit better from the anti-corruption standpoint. But also during the month, uh, Zondo, who was in charge of the Zondo Commission, says that the ANC used its majority in Parliament to keep Zuma in office. At the votes of no confidence, the ANC put the party ahead of the country. And Zondo says that uh, if there were a new move towards state capture, it would probably succeed. That's, that is the, uh, the upshot of what he's saying. And of course, there are still questions hanging over uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's parlor parlor problem. Uh, we believe that Ramaphosa will survive the ANC's elective conference in December, but we also believe that the ANC's support will drop below 50% in the 2024 elections. And this, of course, implies that they will have to make a compromise with another party. We expect the ANC to compromise with the DA, because the policies of the DA are the closest to those of the Ramaphosa administration. The other parties are either too radical or too small. Right, let's turn our attention now to the economy. Uh, we had the surprise creation of 650,000 jobs in the second quarter. Unemployment rate dropped to 34%. Um, we expected the unemployment rate to rise because of the Natal floods and because of load shedding. But it surprised us to the upside. Obviously, Cyril Ramaphosa's reforms in the energy sector are having an impact. Most of the new jobs came in restaurants, retailers, hotels, and cartel car dealerships. The government created 275,000 of those 650,000 jobs. The Reserve Bank expected GDP to shrink by 1.1% in the in the second quarter, but as we learned last night, it actually shrank by 0.7%. Consumer price index, of course, was up by 7.8% in July, up from June 7.4%, mostly because of rises in the fuel price and the price of food. And of course, that means that the CPI is now well outside the target range of 3 to 6%, and we believe it's almost certain that we will have a 75 basis point hike in rates this month here in South Africa. The price of oil, of course, has come back down below $100 in a barrel, and inflation may have peaked. The CEO of Bidcorp, Bernard Berson, says that inflation should come down from here. We note that the PPI, the Producer Price Index, rose by 18% in July, mainly because of rising fuel prices. And the RAND... <laughs> has remained surprisingly strong. The Minister of Trade, Ibram Patel, has suspended import duty on chicken for one year. This should help to keep chicken prices low, but of course local producers of chicken will suffer. We have never really been in favour of tariffs to protect local industry, especially when the product concerned is, is a high bulk, low value product because that means that consumers will pay a premium in, and, and it tends to encourage inefficiency in the local industry. The best example of that, of course, is the cement industry, where you've got a, a very high bulk, low-value product, and we end up importing it from Pakistan. And we have to ask the question, how can the Pakistanis produce cement and ship it here for less than we can produce it locally? That surely implies a lack of local efficiency. The new method of pricing gas, which has been brought out by the National Energy uh, uh, guys, the NERSA, uh, it allows Sasol to raise the price of gas by 96%. That's amazing. That will have a major negative impact on many aspects of the economy that use gas, not to mention consumers. 
who've been switching away from electricity to gas. Consumers, of course, took a big hit in the second quarter, with rising petrol prices, load shedding, hikes in interest rates, all those things. Disposable income dropped. And this can be seen in the Consumer Financial Vulnerability Index, which fell from 53.4 in the first quarter to 48.5 in the second quarter. Some families and small businesses will obviously not survive this. Tax collections have been above forecast. They were 50 billion rand ahead of forecast. And that is, of course, because of the tail end of the commodity boom. And you should compare this to last year when at this stage there were 200 billion ahead of forecast. In the three months to end of June 2022, collections were up 10.6% on last year. Company tax was up 14.4%, mostly due to the mining sector. So in Sibanya's trading statement for the six months to the 30th of June, their headline earnings per share is expected to halve. So that, that tells the whole story. This, of course, was due to some extent because of the flooding at their, um, their mine in Montana in the United States and also to the strike on local gold mines. But falling precious metals prices are a major factor and they have a direct impact on tax collections. Anglo-American also announced that its profits would drop by about a third in the current period. Mining production as a whole fell in June, in June for the fifth month in a row. It was down 8%. Gold production was down 28%, mostly because of the strike at Sibania and, of course, load shedding. The public service unions are in negotiations, and the negotiations are being done by Gordon Guana himself, our Minister of Finance. Obviously, he's trying to keep the civil servant wage bill under control. Uh, in the budget, he budgeted 1.8% increase, but I'm sure it's going to come in much higher than that. You have to remember that the civil service wage bill is the highest single item in the budget, costing about 665 billion rand per annum. Gorongwana has also said that the Treasury will, will pay for Eskom's essential maintenance. So they will give Eskom more money to pay for essential maintenance so that Eskom can keep the lights on and uh, we can s stop having these negative impacts on industry. At the same time as all that's going on, the municipal debt owed to Eskom has risen 10% to $49 billion. So municipalities around the country owe Eskom a total of 49 billion rand. If they could bring that money in, it would reduce Eskom's debt by more than by more than uh, 10%. So that is a very significant factor as far as Eskom is concerned as well. All right, let's turn our attention now to the RAND. Um, just going to put the chart up on the screen here for you. Okay, just take a look at this chart here. Um, in, in our opinion, the RAND's performance has been pretty impressive over the last um, six months to a year. Uh, it's held its ground against the euro at just over 17 rand uh, to the dollar. The euro is also just holding its ground. Sorry, it's, it's held its ground against the euro at just over 17 rand to the euro. Um, and obviously the euro is also taking some strain because the real problem with the situation in America is that because of rising interest rates, there's been a, a rush of money back into safe haven assets like the U.S. Treasury bill, and that is associated with what is known as risk-off sentiment, and risk-off means a weakening of emerging market currencies inevitably, especially the South African rand, which is sort of like the bellwether currency for emerging markets. So while interest rates are rising in America as they are, we can expect the rand to be under pressure, What's interesting is that the rand has not fallen more than the euro against the US dollar. That's the point I'm trying to make. So it's actually been surprisingly strong despite the fact that it's gone above 17 rand to the dollar. We see the rand as fundamentally undervalued against the US dollar. We see it as holding its own or strengthening in due course. The chart, of course, shows that the rand is steadily weakening against the US dollar over the past year. 
The recent weaken, weakness is entirely due to dollar strength. So it's not really RAND weakness, it's more dollar strength. All currencies have been impacted by this right around the world. The bear trend on Wall Street is not a positive thing for the RAND. The stronger that Wall Street the weaker that Wall Street gets, the weaker the RAND will tend to get. The two move in tandem. That's really what I'm trying to say. Okay, let's let's turn our attention now to the oil price. Um, going to look at the uh, price of North Sea Brent oil. Um, let's put a bit more data on the screen here so that you can see the whole picture. Go back to the pandemic. Okay, here you can see the impact of COVID-19 on the oil price. Took the price down to about $25 a barrel. After that, it's been rising in, in an upward channel, bounded by an upper and lower channel line. And uh, you can see, the, here's the impact of the Ukraine war over here, where it broke above the upper channel line briefly. Uh, and then when Biden went to visit Saudi Arabia, we think he made a deal with them to keep the price of oil below $100 a barrel. And oil came down, right? So we're now on the bottom channel line. And our view is that it's quite probable that oil will bounce up off these low levels. Now, of course, a low oil price is good for Biden at home because it means the petrol price in America is uh, well down now below $4 a barrel. And that's good for his ratings, which have been climbing. And um, But we don't think it can last. Uh, in fact, UBS, which is a major international bank, is predicting that the oil price will go back to $125 by the end of 2022. Our view is that it will move back towards this upper channel line and probably reach about $130 in due course. And this, this is due to supply constraints and also a resurgence of demand from China. Uh, as Russian oil production drops, of course, Saudi Arabia is taking up the slack and making a lot of money while they do it. By the end of 2022, Europe will have cut Russian oil imports by 3 million barrels per day. If the oil price rises again, as I expect it will, then that will be bad for equities, of course, because it will push up world inflation, which means more interest rate hikes. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the companies, individual companies on the market. I want to start off just by talking about the construction sector. Um... The Bureau for Economic Research did a survey in the construction sector and found confidence at five-year highs. This is despite load shedding, rising petrol prices, rising interest rates. None of that seemed to matter. Of course, we do know um, that the government announced in 2021 an 800 billion rand investment in construction. And the value of building plans slumped in 2020, of course, with COVID, but has been rising since then. There's been actually a marked increase in the number of tenders. So this is something you maybe need to take into account when thinking about your portfolio. Also remember construction benefits directly from the commodities boom, although that is now fading. All right, let's look at some shares. Trueworths. Um, Trueworths, obviously a massive uh, clothing, footwear and accessories company uh, listed in the JSC and in Namibia has 767 stores in South Africa, 137 in the UK, Germany and Ireland, and 37 in the rest of Africa. In the 53 weeks to the 3rd of July, uh, sales were up 5% in South Africa, and in the UK, 16%. I'm going to put a bit more data on the screen here. Oh, there we go. Um, we suggested that you wait. The, the share peaked at 110 and then fell you know, right down to this bottom here at the COVID. We suggested you wait until this long-term downward trend line had been broken. Um, that breakout came on the 4th of September 2020 over here uh, at a price of 31 Rand 95 or 3,195 cents. Since then, it's moved up to 5,490. We think it's good value because it's on a price earnings ratio of 7.62, which seems to us pretty cheap for a share like this. Grindrod. <clears throat> Grindrod is a massive international freight and financial services company operating in 28 countries. Um, let's get more data on the screen here for you. All right, here you can see the, the position. Um, in 2018, uh, Grindrod 
um, separately uh, unbundled and separately listed Grin Ship, its shipping company, and that's why the share price chart has got this this cliff in it. Um, however, since then uh, it was on a downward trend uh, for quite a while. That that uh, downward trend ended on the fifteenth of July, twenty twenty. And we recommended that you that you get involved at that point. Uh, then it was three hundred and forty cents a share. Now the share benefited substantially from the Ukraine war, and the uh, the difficulties in, in in supply and the shipping industry, and um, the share is now trading for a thousand and seventy cents. So it's gone up very nicely. It's tripled basically since we recommended it. Still on a PE of seven point one five, which is amazing. I mean. This is an international company. It's a Rand Hedge, and you can see, oh, it's actually gone up last night to a P of 7.43. But we think the share is good value at these uh, multiples. Okay, Bluetel. Okay, uh, Blue Label Telecoms, uh, interesting little company. Um, sells tokens, airtime, starter packs, electricity tokens, that kind of thing. Uh, they made a disastrous decision in April 2019 to buy 45% of Cell C for, for 7.55 billion Rand. Um, Cell C is really in a parlous situation. They eventually, Bluetel had written down their, their, um, the price of Cell C to zero on their books. So they carry it on their books, but it's at a zero price. So they're now recovering from that, uh, as I said, disastrous decision. In their trading statement uh, on the for, for the year to the 31st of May uh, this year, headline earnings per share are expected to rise between 34 and 38 percent. As you can see, here's the sell-off that occurred because of the Cell C acquisition. Then we went, in, we did a, a perfect reverse head and shoulders formation. You can see it here. Um, we published an article over here on the 4th of September, and we suggested that uh, you should buy the share at 320 cents. Uh, it's now trading for 660 odd cents, 668. Uh, so it's gone up very nicely since then. We expect it to continue moving uh, in, in this sort of direction. So that's another good share to look at. Master Drilling. <clears throat> Master Drilling has been a favorite share of ours for a long time. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's a company which has a unique uh, technology which they developed. They basically drill holes for mining companies and other companies. So they drill holes in the ground so they can drill shafts for a mining company and uh, they drill tunnels for, for uh, road building and so forth. They were originally a South African company, but now they work in North and South America, Europe, and other countries. They've developed a new horizontal drilling technology, which is both quicker and cheaper than the, the sort of old blast and remove mechanisms. In their results for the year to the 30th of June, headline earnings per share were up 55.5%. And you can see that they, they were unprofitable for a long time. There's an upside break over here. In the, in, the, in the downward trend line, and since then the share has been moving up. So this is a company which has got a disruptive technology, which is just starting to make money and which could actually totally revolutionize the mining industry. We recommended that you buy it at that upside break. It was then 806 cents. It's now 14.75 and rising. It's still trading at 77% of its net asset value, and a multi on a multiple, a PE multiple of 6.17. So it still looks cheap to us. The next share I'd like to talk about is Clientel Life. Clientel Life is a small insurance company offering both short-term and long-term insurance and also doing some underwriting. So it's a small insurance company. Uh, it's not on the books or on the radar of the big institutions. They don't have institutional buyers, really, or, or, or on any scale. Um, but that's good news for private investors because it gives you an opportunity to get in before the big institutions find the company. Um, 
And of course, in the insurance industry, it's a, it's a nice industry for private investors because there's no working capital. It's a service business. They don't have stock. They don't have debtors. They don't have the usual problems. You know, they don't have union problems, that kind of thing. In their results for the year to the 30th of June, 2022, headline earnings per share were up 12%. But they had a 34.8% increase in new business, which is very healthy. The price earnings ratio is 9.52, and the dividend yield, and this is the exciting thing, is 7.67%. So this, this share looks like good value to us. It's still too small to attract institutional investors, but I don't think that'll last for long. You can see on the chart here that there's clearly a bit of an upside uh, breakout over here. And uh, it's in a steady upward trap pattern, but it looks like it's breaking to the upside. The last share I want to look talk about today is Aspen. Um, Aspen is a big pharmaceutical company, huge international pharmaceutical company. Um, let's just see if we can get some reasonable picture. Yeah. Okay, just look at this part of the chart over here. You can see that the share has been in a downward trend. The reason for this downward trend is that this company overextended itself. It took on too much debt, made too many acquisitions, and reached a point where its balance sheet was a bit stretched. Um, now, recently, it's been paying off debt and strengthening its balance sheet. It sells drugs in four categories, thrombosis, anesthetics, cytotoxics, and nutritionals. And it's basically a defensive share. It's international, so it's a rand hedge. And, of course, consumers have to buy medication even in a recession. So it's, it's a very good defensive share. In its results for the year, for the period to the 30th of June uh, 2022, headline earnings per share were up 31%, or for 2% increase in turnover. That implies improved cost management and efficiency. And you can see here, that there is a long-term downward trend, but we've got a double bottom over here in June and July, and now the share seems to be trending up and looks like it's breaking up through that downward trend line. So we believe that this share is cheap at the moment and may be a good buy. Okay, folks, that's what I've got for you today. I hope that you found something of interest in all of that. Uh, remember that our next presentation will be on the first Wednesday of October, so I look forward to talking to you then. Thank you for listening to me.